I'm Abraham, and this is what I have always been told about cast steel. Famous cast steel that so many plain irons chisels are made from. I think you might have heard the same. Invented in around 1750, really high quality steel, but because it's made in small batches, quality from batch to batch isn't always the same. The Bessemer process, the mid 1800s, made it obsolete. By 1900, it's a niche product just for edge tools. Decade or so later, it dies out. Aside from when it was invented, everything else I just said is dead wrong. Henry Bessemer was so bitter about cast steel being better than his steel, he told spectacular lies about it. Oh yeah, this is a good story. Okay, I'm gonna try and cover a lot of ground today. Hopefully I don't oversimplify things too much. My goal is to help you trust that cast steel mark on your plain iron or your chisel. Um, I'm not gonna do a comparison of antique cast steel and contemporary steel. Rex Kruger, James Hamilton have both done excellent videos on that. I've linked to them below. Uh, I also have listed all my sources for this video below and I'll talk a little bit more about them at the end. So we'll get to the train wreck that is Bessemer in a minute. Uh, but to start this story, we need to go back to around 1700, which is right when commercial plane making kind of getting off the ground in England. Edge tool makers knew what quality steel was back then. They were in awe of what was called Damascus steel, which was this layered steel that was made in the Islamic world using Indian crucible steel. But they didn't know how to make it. So what they had access to was called blister steel. They could get it from Spain, they could get it from Italy, they, there was a little bit made in England, they get it from Germany, that's what the good stuff was. The problem with blister steel is because the way that it's made, you have little flecks of impurities in it, and the carbon distribution, which is what makes steel strong, was really uneven. So you get these random weak spots in it. Some analysis that was done in the late 1800s found that the distribution of carbon in blister steel could range could drop from 30 to 40% from the outside of the bar to the center of it. You can take it to the forge, you can hammer it, you can rework it, which is what the Germans did, um, and you can get some pretty decent uh, edge tool steel out of it. So let's jump to the 1740s. This is a story a lot of us know. English watchmaker named Benjamin Huntsman, he figures out if he can get a furnace hot enough, and he uses the crucibles that the local glass makers are using, he can melt that blister steel completely. And when he does that, you get the perfect distribution of carbon. You can get rid of those impurities. And because it's liquid, you can pour it into casts. So you get the name crucible cast steel. And it's revolutionary. It's incredibly good steel. But what he realizes very quickly is that the only way to get good cast steel is to start with blister steel that's made with high grade, very pure Swedish iron. So, all the English and American plane makers start using this incredible steel right away, right? Nope, not even close. But that's a story that I'm gonna tell in the next Working Wooden Planes newsletter. For this story, for this video, let's jump almost 100 years, like 1850-ish. Castile has been widely uh, adopted. And Sheffield, at this point in time, is really the center of not just English steel making, but steel making in the entire world. What's also grown is pretty much everything about the crucible steel process. The crucibles themselves have grown. They used to hold about 13 pounds of steel in Huntsman's days. Now they hold between 50 and 70 pounds. The melting holes, that's what you put the crucibles down into in the furnace. Those have grown to accommodate more crucibles. The size of the furnaces have grown. By 1850, Sheffield is producing about 50,000 tons of cast steel a year. But what remains the same, and this is true from 1740 to 1940, is that it's a very labor-intensive process. You've got somebody who has to watch the furnace, it's usually a young kid, then you've got the guy who monitors the crucibles. He's not just looking for when, they're, when the steel is liquid, you also have to do a process called killing the steel, and that's when you let it sit long enough so that when you pour it into the mold, bubbles don't form. Then you have what's called the puller, and he's gotta be strong enough to be able to lift 30 pound crucible full of 50 to 70 pounds of melted metal out of the melting hole. But he also has to have a delicate enough touch 
so that he does not crush the crucible. Because at this point in time, the crucible is semi-solid. This is one of the reasons that for the most part, this process was never automated. And then you have the teamer. Both he and the puller, their legs and their arm are wrapped in wet rags. They're breathing through rags that they're holding in their mouths to protect them from the heat coming off the crucible. And the teamer's job to pour that melted steel perfectly into the mold so that nothing touches the walls and cools down too quickly. So Sheffield is turning out tons and tons of cast steel, but the world needs more. It needs a different kind of steel. And this is where Henry Bessemer comes in. He's a self-taught entrepreneur. And in 1856, he comes up with this idea where you take pig iron, which is a fraction of the cost of that high-end Swedish iron, and using this process where you blow air through it while it's melted, you can create what's called mild steel. It's nowhere as hard as cast steel. Uh, you can sharpen it, but it won't hold an edge. Um, but it's strong, and it's strong enough for a lot of engineering applications. And importantly, you can make massive amounts of it for comparatively fraction of the cost that you can make cast steel with. It's also a process you can automate. It's not a labor-intensive process. There are many critics of Bessemer's process, and he really struggles to perfect it. But a decade later, a German engineer named Carl Siemens, he comes up with this idea for a different type of furnace that improves on the way that Bessemer does this. And over the next 50 years, a steel made from these two processes literally changes the world. Now this is where it gets interesting. Because mild steel is so much softer than cast steel, Bessemer and Siemens had almost no negative impact on the cast steel industry. In fact, cast steel firms used Siemens furnaces to become more efficient. One of the founders of one of the major cast steel companies said that because you need cast steel tools to machine mild, uh, mild steel, in some places, the demand for cast steel doubled because of Bessemer. This is a quote from a British government official in what used to be called the Ministry of Supply. By 1869, Bessemer was beginning to make inroads even in Sheffield, and soon Siemens' open hearth process arrived also, with its firmer reputation for reliability. Yet until the coming of the electric furnaces in the 20th century, the small crucible and sheer steel makers were not greatly affected in new processes. Cast steel was required for anything that needed a razor sharp edge, for anything that needed to be machined to a very high tolerance, or that needed to be exceptionally strong. So it was being used for any cutting tool, dies, files, chisels, springs, surgical tools, very small machine parts, mining tools, machining tools. Um, it was being used to create enormous castings for these huge machines that were coming out of the Second Industrial Revolution. Propeller shafts and crank shafts for huge ships. Cast steel was used to wrap the first transatlantic communications cable. It was used for armor-piercing shells. Uh, it was used for the inner bores of massive guns. Firth & Sons did a casting for an 81-ton gun required 194 men and 628 crucibles. So that's the backdrop for what happens next. In 1880, Bessemer stands up in front of an industry group and drops this bombshell. He claims that half of all cast steel made in Sheffield is being made from Bessemer steel scrap, not Swedish iron. He's making two implications here. One, that Bessemer steel is not cheap. In fact, it's superior to Swedish iron. And number two, the Sheffield makers are hiding this fact from the world in order to keep steel prices artificially high. A year later, he makes a similar claim. So Henry Seabom, who's the founder of one of the major uh, Sheffield firms, writes a rebuttal in the journal of the Iron and Steel Institute. Um, and he just breaks it down step by step and says, this is why mild steel, this is why the Bessemer and Siemens steel can't be used to make cast steel. Um, and he says, essentially, look, we've been doing this for 100 years. We've been experimenting for 100 years. And the one thing we know is that you can only make quality cast steel 
with blister steel made from high quality iron. The best iron out there right now that we can find is from Sweden. As he put it, there is an old proverb in Sheffield, usually expressed in the terse vernacular of the country, but which may be refined into the expression that if you put his satanic majesty into the crucible, his satanic majesty will come out of the crucible. So Bessemer responds, he calls it a nasty kick at Bessemer Steel, says he's going to provide evidence, but he never does. As far as I have been able to find, he never provides any evidence of this happening. A few years later, Queen Victoria uh, establishes a commission to look uh, into this economic depression that's happening in England at the time. Um, and the commission calls a couple tradesmen from um, Sheffield as witnesses. Uh, and as part of their testimony, they happen to quote Bessemer's uh, claim. And I don't know if the commission didn't investigate it. I don't know if they investigated it and didn't find any substance to it. But no matter what, it's not mentioned in their final re uh, written report. Kenneth Barraclaw, who is the preeminent Sheffield historian, um, he looked into this as well in the 1980s. And he, in fact, he went back and looked into the, the company records from the uh, companies who were around at that time. He could find no evidence of it as well. And Bessemer's own autobiography makes no mention of it. And if you think about the claim for a minute, it kind of falls apart. At this point in time, Sheffield is making half of the world's steel every year. About 100,000 tons of that is cast steel. So we're talking about a conspiracy involving tens of thousands of workers, hundreds of companies related to steelmaking across England, and not a single word from any of them. And if it was true, and it would have revolutionized the steelmaking industry, you can make high quality cast steel for pennies. His autobiography is just painful. He had this massive but incredibly fragile ego. 380 pages of this self-congratulation and weird fabrications. He claims that when he first announced his process, people stood up and cheered. They were so amazed by it. And that he switched bars of cast steel and his steel and steel makers weren't able to tell the difference between the two. Uh, over and over he equates mild steel and cast steel as if they're the same thing. He keeps saying Bessemer tool steel. He writes this at one point. Hence it was an undeniable fact that we could and did produce commercially crucible cast steel of great purity and of any precise and predetermined degree of carburation, with greater accuracy than was obtained by the method employed to produce crucible steel in Sheffield. That is such a bizarre lie. I mean, you don't even know, go, need to go back and look at the historic records, which are all there, to see that that's not true. I mean, you just need to hold up a bar of mild steel and a bar of cast steel. They're structurally completely different. Uh, there are people who say he stole some of the key components or the key parts um, for his process from uh, other inventors, and they're probably right. Um, but the steel made with the Bessemer process changed the world. You know, he's, he's rightfully famous for the work that he did, but his ego just couldn't handle the fact that his steel wasn't the best steel in the world. he would have hated what happened next. By the beginning of the 20th century, cast steel firms were still making edge tools and small castings. They weren't doing the big castings anymore. They switched to what is probably their most impactful role, and that was making new specialty steels. We're talking about high speed steels, and then a bunch of the new alloys that were coming out at the time. So carbon tungsten steel, and chromium steel, and uh, silicon steel, and nickel steel. Anybody in the aerospace industry will recognize that one. Um, these weren't, these are, almost all of them had been invented previously, but the cast steel industry was the first to perfect them and to sell them commercially. Okay, I'm gonna start wrapping this up. I've been talking for way too long. But I wanna hit two things first. One of them is the US, and the other one is the shortcomings of cast steel. Um, here in the U.S., ever since we were English colonies, we've had a booming iron industry, um, but we have virtually no quality 
steel making until Bessemer. When it comes to cast steel, we had that fundamental problem. We didn't have high quality iron that you used to make the blister steel, that you used to make the good cast steel. In the 18, late 1860s, that started to change. One of the things that helped spur those changes is there were new inventions um, that allowed you to purify um, really crappy iron uh, and then to use that iron directly to make cast steel rather than having to go through the blister steel um, step first. I know charts are boring. I'm sorry, I'm gonna show you a chart because I think it's really interesting. Uh, this is American cast steel production from 1881 to 1922. So much for that idea that the industry just disappeared after the turn of the century, huh? But the problem was is that there was this huge bias that English cast steel was superior to American cast steel. Um, so you have American plane makers like the Greenfield Tool Company who are trying to like fight against that. So the 1870, their 1872 catalog addresses it right up front. We wish to call the attention of dealers to our plane irons, which are proving equal, if not superior, to the best stamps of English irons. Uh, Sandusky, 1877, their catalog, they just say our irons are made with English cast steel. So is all cast steel guaranteed to be good? No, there were problems with counterfeiters. Remember those Victorian era tradesmen who testified to that commission? The main thing they wanted to talk about to that commission was that they had found cutlery and some tools that were stamped cast steel that were clearly not cast steel. So when it comes to plane making, that's gonna show up a little differently. So remember, your um, plane iron is made of an iron blank and then a piece of cast steel that's been forge welded to the, to the tip of it. You can, this has been discolored so you can actually see where that, that cast steel is. So this piece of steel would have shown up in America. It would have been stamped cast steel. Um, so the plane makers, the American plane makers or the English plane makers would have had to knowingly use subpar steel uh, for their iron. Did that happen? Oh, I'm sure there were cases of it happening. When you make a premium product, you're gonna have problems with counterfeiters occasionally. So the cast steel industry in America, Germany, France, peaked the end of World War I. What happened after that? A bunch of things. Changing economies, changing labor force, changing manufacturing methods. Um, one of the big ones was the cost of electricity. Cost of electricity had come down enough that it was cost effective to run electrical furnaces and they could make high quality steel for a fraction of the cost um, that you could do it using the crucible method. In 1920, there was still 150 cast steel makers in Sheffield. But the last crucible furnace was demolished in 1968 to make room for road improvements. All the guns and the ships and so many other things were sold for scrap or turned to dust. But whether it was the 1800s or the 20th century, crucibles were not some archaic ancient technology. They were how you made the leading metal technologies of their era. There is a direct line that you can draw from an 18th century clockmaker through to the nickel steels that were used on the lunar lander and on SpaceX's rockets today. These tools are not just good, they are part of an incredible legacy. Thank you so much for watching. I deeply appreciate it. This video was kind of an experiment. I've never done a research-based video before. I usually just do restorations. Um, let me know if you liked it. If you think I should do more, tell me never to do them again. Uh, let me know down in the comments. Um, I relied uh, on the work done by Ken um, Baraclaw uh, very heavily for this video. He was a chemist who started working in the cast steel industry in, in Sheffield um, in the 1930s. Uh, and over the next five decades, he tracked down, he found this incredible wealth of information about cast steel making in Sheffield. His books, they're all out of print. Um, the cheapest one that I found, volume one, is $750. But all of the research that went into those books can be found in his dissertation that he wrote in the 1980s. I have linked down below to copies of that. If you are interested in steel and steel making, they are fascinating and totally worth your time. Um, I also want to plug uh, American Iron, 1607 to 1900 by Robert Gordon. Totally worth a read as well. Uh, next time I'll do a restoration video. Thanks for watching and goodbye.